This is Dennis Ramundi. I'm here with my co-host, Phil Goldberg, author of American Veda, our podcast, Spirit Matters, found at spiritmatterstalk.com. Our guest today, uh, author, speaker, and friend, Valerie Genghis. Her book, Enlightenment is Sexy, A Guide to Magical Life, a, a, Every Woman's Guide to a Magical Life. Uh, Valerie, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on our show today. Thanks for having me. Well, you've, uh, Dennis has uh, already revealed that you're a friend of ours, and um, but we will not let that uh, interfere with asking you very hard questions. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hard and hard. Go ahead. It. Yeah, Phil, start the interrogation. Okay. So we'll start with an easy one. Um, tell us how you came into the spiritual life uh, that you write about in your book and that you've been living the last few years. You're, uh, I, we should have let our audience know, too, that um, you're younger than many of the uh, interviewees we've had who tend to be sort of baby boomer spiritual teachers and leaders. And, and it's one of the reasons we wanted you on the show. Is, uh, we want to hear from the younger generation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm the younger generation, but um, compared for me, to us, well, maybe a little bit, but um, yeah. So I would say my background might be a little bit different. It certainly was um, different than my friends and maybe other family members. My mom was uh, a very spiritual person. She um, had gone in the convent for a couple of years. She didn't make it all the way. Too many rules for her. But um, she was very spiritual, and she was a mystical poet, and she had also been studying the Spanish mystics for years. So when I was really young, she started talking to me about mysticism and St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, and it was just normal conversations that we were having. And she would take, you know, very abstract ideas and explain them to me in a way that I could understand, that I could grasp them. And so these are the normal conversations that we would have at home. And when I was about, I think I was around nine or 10 years old, she said, um, we're going to go see Mother Teresa tomorrow. And so the next day we jumped in the car we went to this small um, Latin Catholic church in Pilsen, a neighborhood in Chicago. And we ended up sitting very close to Mother Teresa and all of her sisters, um, staying through the mass. And then I ended up meeting her after. And wow. just seeing this little Albanian nun that was the same height as me and just feeling the power coming out of her, even as a kid, I felt like my life had changed. So I remember asking my mom, like, you know, what's the deal with this nun and what does she do? And I mean, how can she actually do that much? Just one person. And my mom said to me, she's walking with God. So anything is possible. And something snapped in my brain. And within a couple of years, I was just devouring information um, on spirituality. And then I went on to be a theology major in college, um, and just always having an interest in religion, not so much Eastern religion, but more Christianity and focusing on that. And then my mom passed away. She had been sick for a long time. She finally passed away and I lost it. So I got really sick. I became suicidal. I couldn't imagine a life without her. She was the only person I had in my world that I could really talk to. I felt like she could see me and that was gone. So um, through a series of meeting different people and friends, I was led to learn transcendental meditation. Uh, the thought behind it was if I learn to meditate, maybe I'll get some rest because I was having a very difficult time sleeping. And so off I went to the TM Center in Chicago, um, I told the teacher, you know, exactly what was going on with me. I'd lost my mom. I was suicidal. 
I couldn't work. I didn't want to leave my house. It was a pretty bad situation. And she was very kind to me. She said, don't worry about anything. We're going to teach you how to meditate. And let's just see what happens. Wow. So, um, but did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I wanted to ask, I wanted to interject there. And that is that uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, after your mother passed, your mother gave you this spiritual awakening sort of, or at least introduced you to spirituality. And, and, and as you mentioned, much of it was Christian mysticism, I would think. And uh, people like Thomas Merton. And, and m- many of the Christian mystics, uh, including Thomas Merton, uh, speak of this dark night of the soul, where, where they go through this really uh, horrific period, uh, a lot of self-doubt, questioning. Uh, I know that you, you're familiar with that tradition and, and that, that uh, phenomenon of the dark night of the soul. Would you say in your own spiritual growth and evolution that that period after your mother passed was sort of your dark night of the soul? And, and, and tell us in that period, uh, as, because a lot of people go through depression, they go through what you were going through, but at, at the same time that that's happening, other areas of their life are being enlivened or they're going into some internal direction, uh, even though it's dark, that eventually uh, leads to some awakening, uh, some greater light. Was that your, your case? Did you have a dark night of the soul of that sort? And, and if so, how did you come out of it? I mean, absolutely. It was, it, it literally was dark. I mean, I remember just feeling like it was all just black around me. And um, I didn't even know that you could feel like that. I, di- I didn't know that that was possible to be that low. And so what happened to me is I just was trying to make it through the day. Every day, just like, okay, you know, see how you'll feel tomorrow. And it wasn't getting better. I tried to go to therapy and I tried a bunch of things, but it just, it would not get better. And one day I just couldn't take it anymore. And I remember being in my shower and just getting on my knees and screaming out to God, either help me kill myself or help me live. It's got to be one or the other. You got to like, I Mm -hmm. need to be saved because I couldn't take the pain anymore. So there was a complete surrender on my part at this point. And it was about a week later I learned TM. So I know now that they went hand in hand. Well, interesting. Um, let's um, move forward in time then, Valerie. Um, you had a lot of interesting experiences after you started meditating, some of them involving uh, celebrities and, and uh, uh, some being in the spotlight. What eventually got you to write enlightenment is sexy um well to go back a little bit i just wanted to say that the first day i learned to meditate i closed my eyes they gave me a mantra and with that everything changed i went into the meditation suicidal i came out of the meditation in a state of ecstasy it did not leave me it was permanent. I was no longer like observing God. I had become part of God. It was all happening. And I, I said to my teacher, um, all these years I've been reading books. I have a degree in theology and I learned more about God in 20 minutes than I did all those years of studying all of this. So like something major had shifted. With that, my whole life, you know, my outer world, um, just started coming together and and there was so much synchronicity and I'd have questions and I would just get the answers like right away and before my mom died I said I need you to try and stay in touch with me through music I didn't really know what I was saying I was just kind of desperate but in fact that's what happened I had um, gone through the whole process of learning to meditate I was not working at the time and my teacher said uh you know, we're going to be working with Oprah Winfrey and her entire staff. We're going to teach them all TM. We'd like you to come work with us. And, you know, I just really wasn't interested at the time. I didn't see how that was going to be a part of my life. I felt like I felt better. I had a restaurant background, so I was just going to go open my own place. But because of all the synchronicity that started happening and people that started showing up in my life, 
it became obvious I had to take the job. So long story short, I'm at a concert one night. I wasn't even supposed to be there, but I ended up there. And at the end of the night, very late, Winona Judd shows up. Winona Judd had a performance on Oprah Winfrey's show that my mom was obsessed with. She talked about it all the time. She played the song all the time. It was like a big joke between the two of us. So the gentleman that I was with was actually friends with her. And so next thing I knew, the three of us were standing there together and I'm staring at her. And I mean, it was just obvious to me because I was supposed to, if I was going to take the job with Oprah's team, it was starting that Friday that was Saturday night at about three in the morning. And I just knew like, what were the chances that all of a sudden I'm chatting with Wynonna Judd, this person that was so important in my mom's life and had such a connection back to the Oprah Winfrey show. Whoa. So like little things like that, they were happening. I just knew. Uh, Valerie. Okay. So in your journey, when did enlightenment become sexy? And I, and I think that's a, most people <laughs> tuning in you know, enlightenment and sexy. I, I've always, uh, you know, thought about enlightenment. I'm interested in enlightenment, but I never quite thought of it as sexy. Uh, how, how did that come about? Um, so for my job, I was doing a lot of public speaking. I was also on hand to talk to people um, before they started meditating, after they started meditating, to talk to them about how they were feeling, what they were thinking. And I started interacting with a lot of women. And um, I noticed the same issues kept coming up over and over again. It was a lot of issues about body image, you know, the way they looked, problems with boyfriends, just, just the same stuff over and over again. And I kept thinking, my God, we're like living in a Kardashian world. Like everyone's so externally referenced. That is a tortured mind. That is not happiness. Everything that's amazing that can happen to you. It's going to come from the inside out. So I had a dream one night and I dreamt up the title and I thought, I wish I could just get it across that like enlightenment is sexy, you know, not slapping on a ton of makeup and fake nails and hair extensions, but like having a rich inner life, having some connection to something bigger than yourself. Um, and I'm just, I just put it together, and it was, you know, a little controversial, so I liked that. <laughs> right, right. I, I, I want to, <laughs> Phil, I want to just follow up and say, uh, I really uh, like that phrase you used, uh, external um, reference, uh, uh, an external reference, how, how, how people, when they think of themselves, and in our culture, maybe women especially, but men to a large degree also, uh, when you think of yourself, you th th think of your external image and not anything about your inner life or that that uh, you know takes uh, that's the second banana so uh i i think that uh yeah, I, I mean, I, I and obviously like from we your were, book that comes out yeah yeah we were just all living like by the wrong set of rules you know from the outside in and i just i knew another thing that came to my mind as soon as i learned to meditate was oh my god you know everything i've ever thought i knew was wrong because it was all backwards mm -hmm. and so a lot of the suffering that I had experienced or confusion, that all went away because I just flipped it around. And then all of a sudden I saw everything differently. So, Valerie, your subtitle is Every Woman's Guide to a Magical Life. Are you suggesting that men can't have a magical life? <laughs> <laughs> but my my um, thought exactly, Phil, I, that was my next question. <laughs> Go ahead. We want an answer. No. Um, so when I was writing the book, first of all, I had never been a writer. I've never been a speaker. All of a sudden, like this was all coming to me. And I thought, you know, men are not going to be into this. I have to write this for women because that's who I'm interacting with. Um, that's what I feel comfortable, who I feel comfortable talking to. But since the book has come out, I can't tell you how many men have contacted me and said like, why is this book only for women? So I don't know. Maybe I messed up. I did the best that I could at the time. <laughs> yeah, that, that's okay. <laughs> I hey, was, it was a new experience. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a, a lot of a lot of books and magazines, of course, that focus on uh, women's issues, and um, you would you would have had to do some extra research, I'm sure, if you made it uh, probably unisexual. Hey, Valerie, I, I heard a story I want to ask you about. I was told that uh, sure. 
uh, you, you told your story somehow to Oprah Winfrey and uh, with some of her top executives around. And Oprah turned to one of them and simply said, uh, I want what that girl has. Tell us about that, because Oprah has never, ever said that about me. <laughs> She's told uh, me Or that, Phil, bro. or Phil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so it was my first day of work. I, you know, I ended up telling them, yes, I'll take the job. I still didn't know what the job was. I just knew I had to show up at the um, studio. So I show up, it's a Friday morning, um, you know, I say to the, the teachers there, you know, what am I actually doing here? Like, I'm not trained. I don't know anything. And uh, my meditation teacher said, I want you to go into it was a screening room. I want you to go in the screening room and tell your story. Just like, just start talking. I didn't have any fear. I didn't think anything of it. And I walked in and it was Oprah Winfrey and her president of her company. I looked at them. I didn't feel intimidated. I felt like I was supposed to be there. Like I had known them for ever. I mean, it was just very natural. And I just started talking and it was though the words were coming out of my mouth before I could even like think them in my mind. It was just, I don't know. I kind of felt guided. It was just, it was happening. And I felt really connected to both of them. And um, I just explained what had happened to me. I told them that um, I felt like I had received a miracle and, you know, I think I might have said like with God, all things are possible because I can't believe this is happening to me. And she just said, you know, I want what that girl has. And I, I interrupted her and I said, of course, you're going to have it. Like <laughs> you're learning to meditate. You're introducing silence into your life. You'll have it too. You know, I just assumed that everyone that learned to meditate was going to have this experience and, um, now I know that's not always the case. Yeah. And um, when you uh, decided on the title, well, let me back up a little bit. We've had a lot of people on the show who have talked about uh, what they call enlightenment or awakening or self-realization, uh, terms that have to do or are associated with higher states of consciousness. And there are different ways of looking at it. Um, what did you mean when you used the term enlightenment in the title? I really felt, and maybe I've been influenced by Thomas Merton, but I really felt like I came back to my true self. I really knew who I was. I felt like there was a light inside of me. I was no longer just, you know, thinking about God in an intellectual way, I felt like there was a union with God. I felt like I was a part of everything, whether it was walking in nature, an animal, like looking into someone's eyes, I just felt like I was just completely connected. Um, and that God was kind of like revealing himself through everything around me. And I knew that was extremely different than how I felt, you know, before. And I was able to forgive people. I was able to understand death. I was able to just let each moment be what it was. I wasn't trying to manipulate any situation. I was just present and in it 24 seven. And I mean, that's how I view enlightenment. It's just who we really are. We all have that ability to have those experiences. I just, I didn't know that till it actually happened to me because I don't think you can just read about it in a book. You have to experience it. Right. V Valerie, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are people listening to this interview right now uh, who are in a period in their life where they're feeling very depressed. They're feeling, uh, uh, you know, an emptiness, uh, a lack of direction, maybe because of some trauma that happened in their life. Maybe they don't know why they're feeling this deep depression. And, and, and perhaps they're turning to our show to look for people that might have so, some answers, some guidance. Uh, what do you say to those people out there who are really, really doubting uh, uh, that there is any joy or there is any purpose for their life? 
Um, you know, it's been my experience now that it really is always dark, darkest before the dawn. I think when you pray, someone is listening. I feel like there's always hope. And we all, I have yet to meet someone that has not at one point been brought to their knees. And I really think that that's like the turning point in your life, just like what happened to me. I mean, when my mom died, I died with her. And it's really kind of like that false self of mine died with her. But then everything I've been given since, it's, it's grace. So I believe that that's possible for everyone. And when things get super dark and really you think, I can't go on anymore, it's, it's too much, I feel like that's when you're about to turn a corner. Mm-hmm. And when you turn, or when that happens, not some people, it would seem, would turn the corner and some don't. What would you say to people who are at the corner and don't know how to turn or whether they can turn? You got to keep fighting for yourself. I mean, you got to be scrappy. Things are going to get crazy sometimes, and it's going to be really bad, but there's always a way out. You just got to keep, you know, searching for that solution, praying for the best possible outcome and, you know, having faith. You got to keep the faith because I've just seen it over and over again. You know, it might take 10 years, but you do eventually get a break. It doesn't stay bad forever. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great, uh, inside great, great thought to have because it really, uh, it, it's important to hear these things from other people because when you're going through it, uh, it's very easy to lose perspective. Valerie, uh, I have uh, somebody that reported to me that there was a woman in a cafe uh, named Revelations somewhere in the Midwest that's working on a second book, and I want to know if that woman could be you that's working on that book, and if so, what is that second book that you're working on? It is me. Okay. I'm back in I thought. Fairfield yeah. writing my second book. Yes. Um, I like to write in coffee shops. Um, yeah, so I'm writing my next book on simplicity and surrender. Mm-hmm. I'm keeping it simple. And uh, I just started the process again. I, I love it. I love the whole process from soup to nuts. And I always come back to this little town, and it's quiet. I have no distractions, and I just put my head down and do the work. Valerie, some of the chapter titles in Enlightenment is Sexy are interesting. I'd like to ask you about uh, one or two of them. Sure. Um, Because obviously you've been uh, advocating meditation, and uh, that's a central thing in your life. But there are 21 chapters in your book, so obviously there's more that you uh, suggest to people to live for living a magical life. and the last chapter uh, is titled The Misunderstood Power of Prayer. Um, what is the power of prayer? Why is it misunderstood? And how do you pray? Um, I feel like I see people um, maybe thinking about God like Santa Claus, you know, and maybe having a laundry list of what they want. and. Um, really believing that they are in control and they know what's best for them. And I just don't feel that way. I feel like God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, they know what's best for me. So I always pray, just give me the strength to be able to handle whatever comes my way and give me the clarity to be able to follow a path. And it's not really up to me. I don't have a laundry list of things that I want um, and praying to God, you know, like a little kid on Christmas Eve, right. you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, that's not how it works for me. Right. So I just basically said like, pray for strength, pray, mm-hmm. pray for clarity, pray to be able to have God work through you. And that's, that's real power. Right. Uh, I guess that's summed up in the expression, let thy will be done. Uh, and uh, that's right. Yeah. Also, uh, Valerie, uh, you'd mentioned Thomas Merton uh, before. Uh, this was the uh, readings that you 
read when before you went through your depression, before your mother passed away, and, and I assume that you've gone back and maybe read some of that same literature after you felt the, you you know uh, uh, your your life turned around where you felt uh, awakened. Uh, did you go back and read some of that stuff, and did it take new meaning? I did go back and read some of Merton's stuff. I went back and also found some of the letters that he had written my mom. And really, I mean, you know, it was always, he was always a big deal in our house. My mom was, you know, mm -hmm. had been writing back and forth with him for years. Wow. And she, she loved him, you know. She really mm -hmm. loved Merton. Um, every year we'd go down to his monastery. He was a big part of my life. And, um, but what happened to me is after she died and I had this whole experience, I found Father Richard Rohr, who I always, even when I met him, I said, like, you're my Merton. You mm -hmm. know, he's the modern day Merton. So I found this amazing human and all of his books. And it was just completely speaking to me. I'm assuming very, it's very similar to the experience my mom was having with Thomas Merton. So, you know, I didn't have Merton around, but I have Rohr and I'm able to go see him and read his books and just really feel connected to his writing. I feel like he really understands um, what's happening and he can explain things that sometimes I can't like get out, but it's living inside of me. So that's like the route that I took. Wow. And we should let r listeners know if they're curious about Richard Rohr, that he is uh, one of the people we've interviewed on Spirit Matters. So that's Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, yes. Yeah, please uh, go into right. our archives and, and see that. Uh, uh, Phil, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Valerie, I wanted to ask you about one other chapter title before we have to uh, finish up. Um, there's a chapter titled Emotional Vampires. That's an intriguing uh, title. What what do you mean by that? And uh, who are they? And where are they? I mean, they could be anywhere. They could be <laughs> in your family. They could be your friends. They could be your coworkers. It's people that, you know, feed off your energy. You're around them and you don't feel good. And it's like you have to think about, do I want to keep coming back for more? Do I want to be around this person that doesn't lift me up, that makes me feel awful? Is that the type of relationships I want to have? Do I want someone that's going to deplete me every time I'm around them? And that's just the dynamics between people. Like sometimes they're feeding off of you. And it sounds weird, but I have experienced it over and over again. So I made decisions for my life that I just, I had to be pretty choosy who I wanted around me. And I really watched out for certain people that made me, you know, well, feel like crap. And so I just named them emotional vampires, energy vampires. They're just not, it's not a good combination to be around people like that when you're, you know, a little bit more pure or just a different type of person, I'll say. Great, great advice. Uh, Valerie, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on with us today. Again, the book, Enlightenment is Sexy, Every Woman's Guide to a Magical Life, but a book that should be read not only by women, but by men. Any final words you'd like to share with our listeners today? I just wanted to thank you for having me on the show. I, I always love talking to you guys, so I appreciate it. It's great having and you And we on. appreciate having your coming on the show, and we appreciate all the support you've given us for the show. And um, good luck with the new book, Simplicity and Surrender are two uh, meaty topics. Yeah, We'll look forward great. to see what you bring yeah. to them. And I should add to that Thanks. that uh, for our listeners should know that Valerie has helped us pretty much from day one, get, getting everything up and organized and uh, uh, is much more media savvy than we are. And uh, we really, <laughs> really appreciate all your help. <laughs> uh, thank you. And we look forward to having you on again as soon as that next book is out. Thanks, you guys. Okay. okay.